Hello, everybody. My name is Vladimir Ivanov. I am part of GVM Compiler team at Oracle. And today, we have a joint talk with John about Vector API. And uh, I, I will warm the audience up before the John's part. And uh, uh, given a, like, uh, try to refresh your memory about what the Vector API is and how it looks like uh, uh, right now. So again, a reminder that I am an Oracle employee in a like, legal way, reminder in a legal way. So it's like the fourth GVM LS talk in a row. We have been uh, talking here about uh, Vector API uh, since 2016. And since uh, during that period, uh, we went through three major transitions on implementation level. And like we're still sticking to uh, the ro uh, route we chose back in 2017. So what has changed since uh, last year? Why we still, uh, why, why we have a, a Vector API talk again? So I'll start with the current status. Uh, and uh, then switch, uh, try to give a different perspective uh, on the topic. So one year later, we still uh, not released the first ver version, unfortunately, but we made significant progress from uh, where we were a year ago. So the job is still in candidate state and it's still not targeted, but we uh, did a major uh, uh, refactoring on API level, and it's finally ready for official review. So there is a CSR. Uh, first version is uh, set, submitted for CSR review already. So it will be delivered in the upcoming, uh, upcoming GDK release. Oh, six, at, at most six months later after it's ready. So <clears throat> the plan is to have it as an incubator modding, module and uh, the API finalization will uh, be pending uh, uh, integration both with Valhalla project, both with the inline classes and generic specializations. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the first version is intended uh, to uh, facilitate experimentation goals uh, in different areas. We don't know yet who is uh, the right audience, so everybody is welcome and the feedback uh, is is what we are looking for. And uh, on the implementation side, there was a, a, a lot of work went into product, actually productizing the implementation. So it's in a much better shape uh, than it was a year ago. So what I will talk uh, about today. So uh, I'll give an overview of the implementation to remind you how it looks like. Since, uh, at one year passed, and uh, there are new people in the audience today. And, but I tr I'll try to look uh, at it from a different perspective. So we have been talking about the API, the implementation, but vectors are intended to be numerics. And how does it look like from that perspective? So people expect from numerics a performance uh, 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 very close to what hardware provides. But on a uh, bytecode level, uh, the only uh, representation available is boxed for values larger than 64-bit uh, uh, in size, because uh, long is what uh, the largest carrier type uh, VM provides us. And uh, it's unfeasible to add new types, to extend GVM type system. We have to live with what we have. So the only option to get new numerics is to uh, use what we have and uh, hope for the better. Get VM, uh, optimize away all the abstractions. So on an implementation and MPI uh, level, the main goal is don't make GVM job harder. So try to choose proper abstractions, which VM knows how to optimize, and uh, on implementation level, try to uh, get it uh, as easy as possible to JIT compilers to optimize the abstraction away. So on design front, Vector API was intended to uh, satisfy three major goals. So the API itself should be expressive and portable. Uh, and uh, to add to that, uh, it should be type safe. 
so vectors should be strongly typed. I'll cover that uh, in more details later. Uh, it should allow performant implementation, and performance should be predictable. So, uh, I mean, there should be no surprises uh, when you run uh, the code written using that API. Uh, the, on, an, on code generation, uh, it should provide a high quality a vectorized code which is competitive in performance with what auto-vectorization techniques uh, achieve. And uh, when there are missing functionality on hardware level, uh, the performance should degrade gra gracefully. There should be a, a feasible uh, implementation which, of course, uh, doesn't provide the same level of performance but uh, still uh, <coughs> uh, does a pretty good job. So, uh, what were the options uh, we didn't uh, uh, took? So, one of uh, the options were to uh, try to solve boxing issues by providing, representing vectors as mutable containers. Like, try to mimic a vector register and write values into it and then don't reallocate the boxes, try to share them as much as possible. So it's sort of a vector container. So by sharing and updates in place, uh, it allows to reduce uh, allocation pressure. And uh, that was uh, uh, the hope. Unfortunately, it's not friendly to JIT compilers. In that scenario, uh, in that scenario, JIT compilers not, not only has to track identity of uh, the containers, but also their state. So like, for example, if you pass uh, the container into uh, the uh, call, which is not in line, you can't reason about what's the state of uh, that uh, container. And you have to reload the value once uh, it, you, you return, the, the code returns from the call. So, there are ways to solve that, but uh, it doesn't satisfy predictability goal. So we chose immutable vectors. So vector is immutable. It increases uh, allocation pressure, but it's much easier on JIT compiler side to reason about it. Another thing is uh, what, what's, what's the representation of a vector? Is it a fixed size? So user codes against a vector of like 128 bit, 256-bit, uh, <clears throat> we chose to uh, code to expose length agnostic vector views. So uh, particular vectors, the, 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 a particular shape is chosen at runtime, but the user code uh, against some uh, vector of uh, undetermined, uh, so the vector type doesn't tell you what size it is. So it's shape, uh, it's length agnostic view of the vector. Uh, <clears throat> it was appealing to uh, expose shapeless, let's call it that way, shapeless vector, just the raw bits and uh, let the user decide what to do it, whether to interpret it as a, a floating point, vector of floating point elements or integers. Uh, we chose a different route and uh, all the vectors are strongly typed, so uh, all the operations expect uh, the arguments to uh, satisfy the, to, to perfectly match the expected types and, uh, uh, and it's guaranteed by runtime checks. So if there is any mismatch, there will be exceptions thrown. And the shapes include both the size and element types. That's what uh, comprises the vector shapes. And moreover, there are no implicit conversions involved so user has to explicitly cast between different shapes. Um, also, uh, the, uh, every vector is parameterized by an element type, but it's not just a carrier type. It's not like the size of uh, the elements. It's, it, it has some semantic baggage uh, assigned to it, so <clears throat> it allows to uh, provide extent vectors with uh, exotic operations like unsigned, uh, vectors of unsigned elements, uh, saturated or exact operations on elements and uh, something like mini floats, for example, which have become quite popular these days due to machine learning. 
the API is uh, intended to be portable, so uh, just providing an equivalent of im intrinsic uh, from C, C++, but ported to Java is not an option. So operations on vector API are more than just a single hardware instruction. It's, uh, as an example, I, I, I chose uh, the one I like the most. I, th probably that's uh, the one which caused uh, the most amount of bugs in my experience. So there is a horizontal addition operation in X8, on x86. And the, the interesting thing is like, uh, it differs from 128 bit version is that it shuffles the results from different parts. So if you look at, uh, at uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, upper parts, you see that it mixes uh, elements from source two and source one. So on a 128-bit variant, it doesn't happen. So everything goes smoothly into verse. And well, it's uh, counterintuitive uh, behavior. It's quite irregular. And if you try to expose that on API level, you don't get any portability at all. So that's very <coughs> instruction set specific. So, uh, the operations are orthogonal and that covers all the data types uh, on, uh, uh, available on vectors. So we ended up with uh, something like that. There is a uh, shape agnostic view called vector. There are primitive specializations and that's the part which uh, bags for refactoring once uh, primitive specialization and generic specialization arrives. So those should be, <coughs> should change, should go away. And uh, uh, user codes against those, those like two main entities which are available uh, to users and uh, implementation is able to lower it into, a, uh, in this particular case, to a single machine instruction. So what about implementation? So uh, immutability and length agnostic views caused the most of the problems for us. So we tried to find a way uh, since 2016 how to represent vector operations on JVM level because there are so many different uh, vector instructions uh, we want to use and how to code against those in the actual implementation not about exposing that to the user, but uh, to uh, exercise that in the vector API implementation, and what to do with boxing issues. Until value types arrive, arrive we don't have uh, too much options except to <coughs> rely either on escape analysis or uh, to craft something, uh, stop the gap solutions ourselves. So we ended up with the three major, uh, major uh, tricks so we chose to work with strongly typed vectors. There is a class per vector shape. Uh, parameterized JVM intrinsics, I used the to uh, expose actual behaviors, which vector, vectors uh, uh, use to implement uh, actual operations. And uh, there is a custom vector box elimination analysis crafted for C2. So it's powered by implicit aggressive reboxing and it's not intended to stay long, so once uh, inline cl value classes uh, are there, uh, it should be replaced with it. And aggressive uh, reboxing is, uh, uh, it, it's, it's possible to turn it off, and it sometimes it causes problems. It may cause problems because due to aggressiveness of the analysis, it's possible to observe uh, identity paradoxes. Like, uh, <clears throat> that's why it's aggressive. It's called, I, I call it aggressive. So it's so aggressive that it's possible to observe uh, its effects uh, in the code. If you uh, craft some particular uh, examples, it may cause problems. Fortunately, there is not that much vector API code in the wild existing, so uh, we can teach users what to do until a proper uh, solution arrives. So our experience uh, with vector box elimination 
uh, was that it's crucial to performance. If it doesn't work, uh, don't expect it too much. And the escape analysis, existing escape analysis techniques doesn't actually solve it. So it's fragile and doesn't cover important cases like control flow. We did back in 2017, we did an experiment with MVT prototype and uh, we were satisfied with the solution. Um, so we expect inline classes to solve uh, the problem for us and the, as I mentioned, stop the gap solution is uh, to uh, introduce a custom analysis specifically for vector boxes. Strongly typed vectors are used to represent uh, vectors of particular shapes. Uh, so they are well known to GVM. They are specially treated uh, by C2 and it maps it to vector register when it is able to unbox the values. And, you to, uh, an, uh, and uh, vector box analysis uh, aggressively turns them into values and map them uh, to vector registers. So the implementation diagram is as follows. So there are uh, shape agnostic interface is vector interface which represents shape agnostic view on a vector of arbitrary shape. There are primitive specializations and there are six of those currently. And all the uh, concrete, uh, concrete vector classes, uh, they are hidden from uh, the uh, user. So user can't code against those. So how does uh, vector parameterized vector intrinsics uh, look like? So, as an example, there here is uh, the intrinsics which represent a binary operation. So it's parameterized by a number of arguments which uh, tell VM what's the shape, what's the operation and the shape, vector shape it works on. Uh, there are arguments which are passed to the uh, operation, like in this particular case, it's a binary operation. So there are two arguments and uh, it returns uh, the same, uh, the value of the same type. And if uh, intrinsic fails, there is a fallback uh, implementation in Java which provides the same implementation but written in Java. So, for example, for 1 to uh, 56, uh, uh, into 56 vector addition, here is, here, here is how it looks like. So, there are four arguments which specify the actual shape of the operation and the two more, uh, three more arguments. Two of those are actual vector values and the default implementations. So depending on uh, the uh, behavior when VM can intensify the operation, it will end up as a, uh, in, a fish, uh, 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 as a, as a, in this particular case, as a single instruction, but if intensification fails, uh, it will uh, be uh, compiled into the call of the default implementation and the arguments are passed in. So what about performance? So there are a number, qu quite a few benchmarks already developed for the Vector API. Some of them are developed by people who work on Vector API and uh, there are uh, a number of uh, benchmark suits uh, which uh, people uh, from community, especially Richard Statin and Lev Srebrikov did uh, to uh, experiment with Vector API. The results are good. There are definitely some missing pieces, so some, un uh, some um, regressions in a way that uh, uh, the scalar version may be faster, but that's due to implementation uh, bugs and uh, if uh, you don't hit them, uh, the performance is uh, comparable to auto vectorization, but uh, it's predictable. So, <clears throat> but what 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 happens when it doesn't go well? So, what are the cases when performance may suffer? So, there are two main issues, and that's box elimination failures. So, if uh, there is a Boxing in a tight loop, it will show up uh, in uh, the uh, on the score. So it, it will like uh, the this like throw would go south mostly, and uh, intensification failures uh, uh, have quite disastrous performance effects. 
sometimes due to uh, failures because they cause uh, box failure eliminations, and that's implementation de detail and specific to the uh, custom uh, vector box elimination pass. Uh, and sometimes uh, due to a mixture of intrinsified and non-intrinsified case, since non-intrinsified case on default implementations, uh, it causes boxings as well. So what may be the cause of uh, box elimination issues? So like identities and sensitive operations. So, so, uh, so the uh, reboxing is aggressive, uh, box elimination is still conservative. So if box identity is needed, is used, uh, the box will be preserved and the allocation will happen. Um, <clears throat> for now, it tre it's treated as a user mistake and the users are uh, uh, responsible for avoiding identity sensitive operations on vectors. Uh, inlining failures, uh, uh, like if uh, you shape your code in a way it's scattered around multiple methods, there is always a chance uh, inlining will fail due to either some uh, profiling issues or uh, compiler aligning heuristics will kick in or some uh, uh, hard coded limits uh, will be reached. So there are no guarantees uh, something is always in line. There are some annotations, which, VM annotations which may help, but uh, they have any effect only in uh, trusted code, like GDK itself, and unfortunately isn't available to, uh, to users. So uh, the main problem caused by inlining is uh, boxing around the calls. So the vector, vectors will be boxed and unboxed around uh, the calls, and that's, uh, that's, that, that, that causes problems. Uh, intensification failures happen when there is missing hardware support. Uh, it's treated as an implementation bug when uh, you use a preferred species, like there is an API which provides you a most efficient uh, vector shape, and if in that particular case uh, there is some missing hardware support for some operations, it's, it's an implementation bug. But the API provides you a way to instantiate a vector of particular size, and there are no guarantees in that case. All the operations are um, supported. That's user responsibility. Another reason for intensification failure, there is not enough information about the operation. Uh, all the operations on the parameterized intrinsics which specify the shape of uh, the uh, operation of the intrinsics should be compiled time constants. JIT compiler should see them as a constant so it's able to intrinsify them. Uh, if it's not the case, uh, uh, default implementation is used. And uh, that's, main, that's the main reason why there are so many uh, speciali ve concrete vector classes because uh, there, are, there, there is a trade-off uh, between uh, uh, specializing every, specialize everything, parameterize all the arguments to constants, like, uh, but you need a dedicated pl a place to put the call sites on, and that's uh, concrete uh, classes, or you put them upwards in the class hierarchy, but then the types become, uh, the values become uh, non-constants, and you have to rely on the JIT to be able to find out what's the actual value. If it doesn't happen, then uh, you get a default implementation instead of a call plus intrinsic, intrinsified version. So there is some trade-off there. So for now, the recommendations are to rely on preferred vector spaces and uh, don't use concrete uh, uh, vector shapes unless you know what you're doing. And uh, it's favorable to keep vector code as a single me method. Uh, to, if, 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 if you want to guarantee, to avoid inlining issues, that's uh, unfortunately the only solution which is available as of now. So what about better VM support? What can we expect uh, in the future? Like what uh, inline classes give us? So it's a reliable solution to boxing issues. So we know it will completely 
remove the need for custom vector box elimination logic and just by switching to inline classes on concrete typed vector classes should be enough. Those are hidden from uh, user and uh, uh, shouldn't be visible, so that's a safe migration move. Uh, the uh, treatment of identity sensitive operations uh, is uh, uh, good as well, so there is a consistent behavior and uh, either irrespective of the, of the actual identity, uh, either, uh, either operation succeeds or it, it reliably fails on in, uh, inline classes. And flattened uh, representation also allows to uh, choose a better design, like separate raw carrier types, like super longs we had back in 2016 now uh, with uh, the first iteration, and they have typed vector just encapsulate them and uh, define all proper operations on them. So uh, what about inlining and intensification? <coughs> Unfortunately, inline classes doesn't completely eliminate inlining issues. Profile, profile pollution is still there. Uh, possible answer could be vector calling conventions. So for inline classes, there are already uh, support uh, for custom calling conventions in the Valhalla repo with uh, LWorld implementation. And it allows to, sc uh, to pass inline classes in scalarized form, like as, a, as a individual components, of, uh, and not as a box buffered representation. But that works only if uh, the signature contains a reference to the mentions inline class, and, but we uh, have uh, uh, primitives. Us users don't see uh, the uh, concrete classes, so they can code against them, and the signatures will contain either vector or uh, primitive specializations of vector. So those are interfaces, and uh, uh, that causes problems. So what could be done here? So it begs for a different representation, so a single inline class which uh, encapsulates both the raw value and the type information, vector shape. Uh, like uh, the max vector we have uh, right now, thanks to ARM folks, uh, it's like a vector which has the width of the maximally available register at runtime. So it's, it's, it's uh, stable at runtime, but it depends, the, the actual size depends on uh, the actual hardware you are running. So it's consistent for a single run, but the type doesn't explicitly say what's the actual size. It's not uh, the complete answer, because uh, 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 still uh, uh, we need a, we need a custom entry point, because uh, that's the existing techniques won't work. So uh, primitive specialization is still an interface, and there, there are maybe multiple represent implementations of that interface, so there should be some uh, profile-guided uh, optimization at runtime, which will choose uh, the proper entry point based on the actual call site. So that requires additional work for intensification, and uh, it, the type, type information isn't statically known anymore. So it's less of an issue for new hardware, like both uh, uh, AVX512 and SVE uh, allows to code in a shape agnostic manner. So SVE does that directly with a, uh, with a uh, Yes, VLAN register. So you just put the value and uh, there and uh, you are done. On uh, AVX512, uh, you can use predication to change the vector size and, uh, at runtime. So as a summary, I would like to compare vectors with uh, some other uh, numerics. So vector pushes uh, the platform to the limit on all aspects. Like, it needs new carrier types, uh, it heavily relies on intrinsic support to exercise hardware, it benefits a lot from inline classes. Other cases, uh, not, uh, sometimes they 
depends, sometimes not. But uh, <coughs> with the, 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 what, what makes vector difference, different is uh, shape agnostic stuff. So those are not concrete. So like yeah. uh, other numerics case, other numerics we have, they aren't, they, 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 they uh, work well with a single implementation. It doesn't work for vectors anymore. But it seems like there, there will be other cases, especially with the uh, floating point where there are so many different uh, new formats for mini floats, then users will desire to code in a shape agnostic way, but choose a proper uh, representation, proper number format at runtime. And, uh, don't and, and don't need to change the code there. So that's it. Thank you. So it's John's turn. Shall we tempt fate and try a demo? Why not? All right. Um, yeah, see what happens. So here is a uh, bleeding edge Panama build. And uh, yeah, it comes back. And then I'm going to go back through my history and actually get something. All right. I'm going to I'm going to make some arrays. And Actually, the arrays have been filled with stuff. A is filled with squares. B is filled with alternating signs. And now I'm going to um, pull vectors out of A and out of B. And I'm going to process them and store them back into R. And so the, um, the nice little loop that does that flashed by here a second ago. OK, there it is. Let's read through that. Um, you'll see some of the um, names that showed on Vladimir's slides here, float vector is one of those immediate abstract subtypes of vector of float, a vector of something. And so we're using a, a factory method to build a float vector um, from an array. Oops, actually, let's see. Hang on. Where's the VSP? Maybe it's already set. VSP is the vector species I've decided to use. That's actually acquired using by saying float vector preferred species. So that what that says is on this particular laptop, if I want a vector of floats, uh, it's going to prefer that I work with S256 bit, which is a um, AVX2 register, and it has eight lanes. That those those numbers are mutually those quantities are mutually constrained. So that's VSP. And there's also a number K in here, which is a loop invariant. And that's just a tiny little uh, number. What we're going to do is we're going to um, load A and B from the vector, A and B vectors from the A and B arrays. We're going to take the square root of 1, which I have populated previously with squares. So my numbers come out it's legible. And the other, it'll multiply by the other, and then it will add uh, the, the scalar K. Um, that lane-wise SQRT is a unary lane-wise operation. I'm going to explain what lane-wise means in greater detail, and it's all in the slides, too. You can go over it uh, after, after this time talk time has run out. Um, then you do a lane-wise ternary operation on a B vector and a K scalar and using the uh, fuse multiply add. So let's go back and do that. Where is it? There it is. Okay. Oh, amazing. It worked. Okay. What do we get? What do we win? Um, well, there's the contents of R. It used to be all zeros. And uh, now it has um, a bunch of alternating sign near integers, near zero, near one, near two, near three. And those, were the, those are the perturbed by FMA uh, square roots of the original uh, A values for the A values. So that's, um, in a nutshell, that's, that's proof that vectors actually work. Um, and then if you were to uh, actually run this thing and warm it up, you'd, you'd see code that was um, pretty credibly equal to, like Vladimir said, uh, what you would expect from, um, from a, a vectorized loop. 
let's, let's go to the formal part. So, huh, looks like the demo worked, so that's good. Um, what's cool here, uh, vectors, vectors by themselves are cool. I remember when uh, Sun came out with the, arguably the first uh, uh, commodity uh, level vector processor, which was the Spark Viz instruction set. Uh, I thought, wow, that's very clever. They, they have all this register width, and then they, they use it to issue par uh, many um, parallel operations. Uh, Viz was only 64 bits, but now we're up to 512 and getting towards 2048. So the, um, there's a lot you can do in, in one instruction if you keep, keep all of your, um, your plates spinning on all the different poles that they need to be spinning on. If you, if you succeed in organizing it properly, you, you, I like to think of it as right-sizing your computation. You are pulling data through memory in the chunks that the memory likes to see, and you're pulling it through the, the CPU in chunks the CPU likes to see, not little tiny one scalar at a time. Um, so that's pretty cool. What else? Um, uh, as, as Vladimir just showed you, Java's got some new tricks. Um, and uh, this is uh, what we're aiming at is something new, which is being able to write portable assembly, uh, assembly uh, portable explicit uh, vector code that you used to have to use uh, C intrinsics or assembly code to get, but now you can write it uh, in your IDE in Java and be able to debug it. Um, the, the Valhalla connection is cool. And then also the, the whole exercise of doing vectors has taught us a lot about what kind of templates we want uh, for, from Valhalla, what, uh, what, what future primitives might look like in Java. Um, it, it, it's, um, it's, like, it's one of those exploratory missions where you, you come back with lots of spin-offs. So what about vectors? Um, a vector is a dense tuple of scalars. By dense, I mean there aren't any bits wasted. A scalar uh, is not always dense. A 64-bit register holding a, a, a byte is a very common occurrence on your, on your processor, um, on any of the processors that we have, and that's not dense. That's only using, uh, that's only using 12 and a half percent of the bits. To carry, assuming that that byte is, uh, is, is, is full dynamic range. Vectors tend to be more dense in that uh, it's a big chunk, and yet there's often, not always, but often there's payload data spread all the way across the vector. Uh, I'm going to use some non-standard not notation and terminology here, but please bear with me. This is, uh, this is sort of driving us towards the uh, vector API. Um, and, and so the, a vec the length of a vector is its v-length, its primitive type is its e-type, uh, the size in bits, like 32 for an int, is its E size. Uh, a location is, is a lane, so there's a little uh, bit of uh, pseudo notation for a vector. I'm using dot zero to mean lane zero. Um, there is a classification of these things. They are sized according to the product of their uh, element size and their length. And then uh, the shape of the vector, like uh, an, a, um, an AVX2 register, for a YMM register. That sh that's, a sh that's, an, that's a hardware example of a shape. Shape determines bit size and register class, and, uh, and that, when you combine that with either v-length or e-type or e-size, it, it gives you the other parameters. So um, the, the full set of information about a vector that I showed you earlier on with the VSP thing, uh, I won't go to it, um, is the, called the v-species, the vector species. A species is shape plus e-type, or shape plus uh, plus length plus kind of, of, uh, of lane floating or fixed. Um, here's some pictures of vectors to drive home the fact that these things are dense, dense, dense. You'll notice that the, a, a single 128-bit vector can be partitioned according to the size of its scalars into different numbers of lanes in order to keep things dense. There aren't any unused bits in these, uh, in these guys. That's, that keeps the hardware ru running uh, in a balanced way. Uh, the operations on these things are routinely distributed across lanes. We use the term lane-wise to describe this, this pervasive phenomenon. So here's a unary operation. Um, again, this is non-standard notation. Um, and uh, what, the way it works is if you apply an operation to a vector, you are applying it to each lane and then collecting up the results of those lane-wise operations. Uh, this is a generalization of scalar multiplication on classic linear vectors. And perhaps this is why we call them vectors. Uh, distribution of scalars also works. If I, um, if I have an element um, and I operate with, that, with an element, a single lane value, that, that will get broadcast uh, to all the lanes and operate in place with each one of them. So there's a broadcast operation. 
there's also n-ary distribution. If I, if I want to put several vectors together, uh, assuming they're all of the same uh, uh, species, or at least lane count, uh, then what I, what I do is I uh, do, uh, I take each of the uh, lanes of each of the, uh, of the vectors and, and put the operation together in that each lane. And that's, well, that's just a distributive law for you, right? There's nothing, nothing special here. This is a generalization of the classic distributive law that you learned in high school. So here's, um, here's an example of, a, of, um, of how you would use these guys to do actual real work. Suppose I started with, a, with that loop I showed you, an F, a fuse multiply add of a square root of some first array times a second array plus a, a third scalar. And I did that over some set of, of uh, 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 some arrays A, B, and, and uh, stored it into R, I can vectorize that loop. Um, how many of you am I boring? This is really like vectorization is kind of known technology, right? Um, you can see how this, this loop here turns into logically a doubly nested loop where the inner loop is unrolling by V length and the, um, and the, uh, the outer loop it, uh, pr proceeds along by V length strides. So that's classic vectorization. Um, I'll show you more. Also, memory access, as I re referred to earlier, is, uh, is blockwise. So what that means is that um, when you load from an array, uh, you, you load a vector's worth of stuff contiguously. So the, the information is dense in the vector in, in the register. It's dense in the vector in memory. You take a bitwise image from memory and you plunk it into your vector register or you process it and you plunk it back out. Uh, so here's some examples um, of, of what it looks like, and the names and terminology here are taken from the vector API, but there, there's nothing here that's, uh, that's peculiar. It's all very normal how, uh, to any, uh, any vector ISA that I am familiar with. So here's, here's what that square root thing looks, would look like when everything is turned into um, distributed operations on, uh, through lane-wise uh, vector operations. Um, and this is, again, that, that loop that I showed you a minute ago during the, during the demo. All right. Here's a picture that, that, that I hope suggests why um, the, the blockwise and the lanewise go together. Uh, here's a, 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 a pro, you're processing over a long array of A and a long array of B stuff, and each vector that you pull out is kind of like a window into the array. It's about a cache line's worth or a good fraction thereof. Uh, it, go, it, it, it zips through the, uh, the CPU with a small latency and small pipeline cost, and then zips back out into memory um, at, at the bottom of the screen there. The, uh, the add operation there is, um, is shadowed with itself four times to suggest that there's four parallel adds happening, one for each lane, and it all happens at the same time. This, by the way, is called SIMD, sing Single Instruction Multiple Data. So why do we do this? Well, we get a speed up factor of V length if we, if we get everything straight, uh, straight and li lined up straight because the arithmetic units are replicated on the chip by V length. Um, the, uh, the loads and stores are, um, are per cache line, which means that each cache line tend to be, tends to be touched just once. Uh, if the processor stalls for some reason, um, it's all right, the cache line can go away. You're not gonna have to reload it again because uh, you forgot one scalar um, that, that, was, that you still needed to get from that cache line. You basically, uh, you, you make fewer accesses to memory uh, and, they, and they count for more, each one of them. Um, the, the lane operations do not need internal synchronization in the, um, uh, in, inside the chip. They are like expertly piloted fighter, fighter planes. They don't bump into each other as they fly through the, the silicon. Compare this with a, a equivalent scalar loop. Uh, the scalar numbers need to be carefully tracked by the silicon to make sure that they don't use each other's resources because they're, um, they're not separated in principle. Unfortunately, this leads to a user model where you have to unroll by hand by V-length. Um, sometimes a JIT will do this for you if you're lucky, but it's hard to control. Um, by the way, if this happens, either because of the JIT or because you do it, um, the JIT may then take your uh, V-length unrolled thing uh, turn it down to a single vector instruction and then unroll that further because th there may be multiple vector issues going on uh, and you can hide pipeline lat latencies. So that's good, but really, am I really asking you to do hand unrolling? Yes, uh, but you're saying clearly there must be a better way. 
oh, what are the workarounds, John? We don't believe that, that you're selling anything good here. Um, because originally, the, your algorithm is a, just a big hunk of data, just any old big data. It's, a, it's an image, it's a hunk of text that you're parsing up, it's some big thing, it's a BLAS array. Um, what do you, how do you work with it? it? Ultimately, it's the big array and the little scalars, and any vectory thing at a middle scale seems like just wasted, uh, wasted attention for the programmer, uh, the possibility of bugs. On the other hand, as I just showed you, the CPUs and memory units like to work with these middle size units, not the whole array at once and not the scalar. Um, so greater attention and skill can pay off. Now, you can just close your eyes and say, the vectorizer does it, the vectorizer does it, the vectorizer does it. I feel the force, the force is in me. But that's only if you're lucky. Uh, there are also direct array processing notations, like in MATLAB, Julia, APL-like languages, good old for all and Fortran. Those guys, um, if they're well implemented, those let you just mention the entire array and say, here, go to it, do the whole array. And there's some, um, th that, that's probably the best way. If that's gonna get your job done, that's probably the best way. In fact, that's the sort of thing we wanna build in Java, I think, on top of the vector API, uh, some, some array language stuff. Um, you can also say, you know what, I'm smart. Um, I can stay up all night and drink Red Bull. I'm gonna do assembly code. Uh, the problem with it, besides being hard to write, it has a short shelf life. Assembly code doesn't last very long. It goes out of date with the next hardware revision. Suddenly it doesn't perform. You're no longer the smartest kid on the block. What went wrong? Um, so explicit vector programming, like with assembly code, um, if for all doesn't help you and the auto vectorizer doesn't, uh, doesn't ring your bell, uh, and, and you just can't get up in the, uh, stay up all night and do the assembly code, sometimes explicit vector coding is your best option out of all the worst ones. So Java's got it. Um, so on the middle ground, what if you could get close to assembly code, like Vladimir was showing you, um, from C or Java, and C you can do it. Uh, the, this, this, this process started in part with me um, trying out this, the C vector intrinsics, and realizing there was some frustratingly cool stuff in there, but it was hard to, hard to enjoy. So I wanted something more enjoyable. Um, so let's get something that, that will unroll and vectorize more reliably. Um, C's thing works pretty well, but it's, uh, it's C-level tooling. It's not all the comforts of Java Home for you. So let's try Java's vector API. It's explicit like the C with the intrinsics, one method call, often approximates one instruction or a small number of instructions, um, but it's packaged Java style and works on the Java tool chain, and even in JShell, as I showed you earlier. And there's an extra benefit. Uh, Java JIT compilation is dynamically sensitive to what platform you're running on. So you can run the same code on a big honking AVX 512 machine and a little tiny MMX machine, and you'll, you'll get appropriate results on, in both places from the same workload. So write once, unroll everywhere, sort of, kind of. Um, you've already seen these types, so I'm gonna skip over pretty fast. Uh, the loads and stores are array-friendly, NIO-friendly. Uh, the lane-wise operators, there's, there's a rich set of them, arity one, two, and three. There's a lane-wise tests with arity one and two, conversion methods. Um, there's a mask type which captures conditionality. Uh, and helps you control edge cases on loops. Did you notice that my loops that I did in the demo were of length 24, the, the arrays were length 24? You know why I chose that? Because if I chose 23, I'd get an array out of range exception because the vector would step off the, okay. There's ways to fix that. Uh, I didn't show you in the demo, but masks will be your friend with that. Um, there's something called the vector shuffle for doing local movement. Uh, the, the requirements, as Vladimir has already said, and I am now redundantly saying, is this, this thing basically has to look like Java. It has to be uh, friendly to Java programmers, and it has to be able to directly express the kind of things that a vector, if you need a vector loop, you, you want to express. That means things like string matching, hash code, dot product, crypto. There's a number of things uh, of uh, benchmarks we've played with that, that work. Here's the important thing. It's gotta have a shelf life that's longer than your typical piece of assembly code. Uh, Java code that was written in the 90s is still running in production, and we take that as a serious responsibility. Uh, the vector API um, might not have that long of a lifetime, but we want it to be more than just one machine re release. 
Um, if there is a special vector instruction you want to write for one machine release, we, we aspire to be able to give you that with some probability, but what we really want you to do is write something that is shape agnostic, and then as, as machines give you bigger and bigger shapes, your code still runs just faster and faster. Um, so, yeah. And fi a final requirement is that uh, the notation should be natural. You should be able to just say vector, you know, equals vector times five plus other vector What's the big deal? It's like what you learned in high school, right? It's not that hard. We're all software people. We can program compilers. But it's not true yet, and there's deep reasons why it isn't true. And yet there's, a hope, there's even hope there. Um, here's a, uh, a blast summary, which I'm going to click off very soon, of the sorts of methods that you'll find in the vector API. I will not go over this line by line. Uh, here's another organization of similar information. These are the lane-wise operations. Um, the signatures are on the upper box, and the constant operator tokens are on the lower box, lower boxes. So uh, for the um, ternary lane-wise, it's not really spelled LW, but I didn't have enough space to say lane-wise on the far right there. Uh, the ternary guys are very few. There's, there's fuse multiply and add for floating point vectors. And then there's a bitwise blend operation, um, sort of a quick draw merge. Um, bit vector merge for the uh, non-floating point vectors. Uh, there's a dynamic check to say, that says, are you a floating point vector? If not, you're not going to get an FMI, your FMA, you're going to get an unsupported operation exception. So this is, this is kind of Java-like. Um, yeah. Conversions are their own separate thing. There's a zillion conversions because it's a two-dimensional matrix, plus there's several different modes of conversion. There's in place, zero extend, casting. Uh, conversions are are underappreciated by C and Java programmers because they're invisible in the code, right? But remember I said that the um, payload inside a, a scalar register is often different in size from that scalar register, right? You can't afford that with vectors. With vectors, you want your payloads to be the same as the lane size. That means if you cast from byte to long or short to float or something like that, you're going to need to do something uh, to adjust for the different lane counts. That's pretty complicated, and, and so the um, the, the conversion, uh, one place that complication shows is with the, with the conversion operations. So uh, how do you deal with this? It's, there's, a, there's an opposition. You, you have these fixed size chunks that just fly through uh, the CPU beautifully and land perfectly in memory, sticking a three-point landing. Um, but uh, when you do something in the middle that changes the size, like you're doing, you're counting byte codes up, but you're doing a 32-bit uh, intermediate sum because you're calculating hash code, how do you deal with that? Well, you need a vector that has 32-bit lanes for the intermediate parts, but it's 8-bit lanes for the beginning and end parts. So what you need is a conversion thing, and you need a, uh, you need a solid convention for, and this is something I think that it might be new to the vector API uh, here, it, you need a solid convention that deals with these multi-part answers to expanding or contracting questions. So uh, if I convert a byte to int, um, I actually must supply a part number with the conversion operation that says which of the four parts I'm interested in receiving. And you can always say part zero if, if you just say, well, just give me the first few, however many fit, don't bother me about this part stuff. You're being too, you know, compulsive. Well, okay, just say part zero. But if you, if you want them all, you say part zero, part one, part two, part three. Um, uh, a number of the vector operations are, have a part numbering scheme. Here's an example that uses uh, a temporary expansion. Suppose I, am, I have an array of 16-bit numbers. I want to compute their square roots. I want to use floating point numbers to do it. That means I need to expand the two-byte lanes in, in, temporarily into four-byte lanes, take a square root, and then contract again and save it out again, right? Well, that's the code. Um, I won't uh, go into the code, but I will show you a diagram. That's what it looks like in data flow. So you come in at the top. You've got narrow, narrow lanes. Um, you, uh, you do your conversion, your, your S to F conversion twice with part zero and part one. Uh, you get two answers. You do square root on both of them. Uh, you know, this, is, this, is, this is the worst possible answer except for all the other worst answers. You do, you do your square root on both of them and then you, um, and then you park your answers uh, in a contract, contracting F to S operation in the, in the upper and the lower halves and that too is controlled by a part number 
contracting part numbers are always negative or zero. And then you or together your results and you're done. And uh, the theory here is that um, this is easier to do it this way than, than just with assembly code. Influences from Intel, many of them. The, by the way, uh, I am absolutely thankful to the Intel team for, uh, for their long-term uh, commitment to this project. Uh, they have done a beautiful job bringing it up uh, to, to high quality. Uh, they've got great test suites, great performance regression tests. They, they've put really smart people on it. And um, so you can see Intel fingerprints on this. Uh, there's a lot of names that you might find in AVX also, like Blend, uh, although they're also traditional. Um, the, uh, the, the vector mask is cleverly um, designed to uh, support both kinds of masking um, on the AVX 512 versus the AVX 2. The, um, the, the support, the operations that you find in, uh, in the vector API are ones that you might frequently find in, in AVX. Um, there's a, there are reduction operations. There are no scans. You know what, um, the hardware people aren't giving us scans, even though that's a super useful um, operation, especially the segmented scans. That's, that's a lesson uh, I learned back in the days with the uh, thinking machines. Um, but eventually, eventually we'll discover that segmented scans are there and we'll add them to the vector API too. Uh, scatter and gather ops are a little wobbly, but they're, they're sort of there and cross-lane cross permutations are overwhelmingly done on AVX with a, uh, with a vector of steering indexes. So we have a vector shuffle type that reifies that at the portable level. And, but we don't try to have operations for what I call the funny butterflies, all the funny little pack, unpack, zip, unzip, that um, you know, they're all these spe special purpose, we also call them snowflake instructions because each one is a special snowflake, it's different from every other instruction. And the, the, it's, it's, a, it's like a trap for the assembly language programmer to, to learn these things takes months, and then you're not even sure what you've learned. Uh, SVE has also contributed to this. Uh, SVE made us realize that vectors might not be power of two sized. So that's good, that's a generalization. That's a portability, um, a port, uh, portability improvement. And um, so it's similar to AVX, uh, C, C expression support and Java expression support is there. There's some nice movement instructions. and. Uh, Finally, the AV, uh, SVE has something that, that I'm not sure if AVX has, which is a data-driven compress operation, the mask-based compress. Um, but it, that, that, if you're doing a, a, a filtered loop, you need a mask-based compressed operation to move the, move the lanes of stuff you want down and throw away the lanes of stuff you don't want. All right, I'm out of time, so I'm gonna tell you what works and what doesn't, and then I think I'm done. Um, vectors or objects. Uh, it works, we get hot assembly loops, um, we get a large range of instructions that are reachable, we aspire to reach um, 80, 90% of them, reach all the good ones, some of the snowflakes maybe not. Um, I think we can do this for other ISAs. Uh, we have reasonable looking portable semantics, we have tried hard, and the Intel people have tried hard, to, um, to not put Intel specific uh, dependencies by mistake into this API. Um, I look at it and I say, could I implement APL on an, on an unknown processor using this? And the answer is kind of yes. Um, so that, but also there's a, there's a hook for being able to say, no, I want a particular shape and I want a particular weirdo operation. If I can find the, 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 the you know, some weird carryless multiply operator, it's not advertised. It's not in the uh, public API, but if I can get one and I can shove it at the vector and it, and it accepts it, then there's my carryless multiply instruction. I don't have to like wait for the entire world to put carryless multiply as a method on vector before I can get to it. All right, it doesn't work. Well, Vladimir told us about some of the failure modes. Uh, the, the code inside the implementation is tricky to, to maintain, as Vladimir was saying. Um, we say vector integer, but we really want int. That's, we're just waiting for Valhalla to, to get more, um, more there. Uh, Java stops at eight primitive types, and we pick six of them for vector lane types, but we sure want more. Oh my gosh, like a, you know, B float, stuff like that. Um, and then, of course, the fact that the notation's all wrong. Um, you really can't ask your customers to say a.mol x.add b and say that that's the answer 
for the long term. Um, and operator overloading stinks because it's just endlessly misused because there's no good contract on our oper operator overloading. Uh, Neil Gafter, uh, luckily I don't have to explain this point because Neil Gafter already explained it. Um, and, and, uh, but basically, when you um, one thing you can do in the near term is uh, crack those lambdas. You can take um, you can take a lambda part that's just working on long values and say, you know what? Pretend you're not working on longs. Pretend you're working on B floats and give me something that will uh, that will give me the corresponding computation. Um, this gives a smooth upgrade path from uh, from the limited set of operators we have today to full user lambdas. Let me show you a little bit more about that. Um, what if you could have a little AST language that would take all these little individual operator tokens and put them together in compositional trees? How cool would that be, right? A little combinator logic for, for vector operators. Everybody knows how that would work. And so then you would make my operation, oh, I spelled it wrong, and you would, um, this doesn't work by the way, uh, and, and you distribute it lane-wise and it would do all the little operations inside the combinatorial graph all at once, that's your loop kernel and you're done. Okay, that's good, uh, and if we add some static Java intrinsics, then we can even uh, do static checks on them, or you could do something with strings if you're, um, if you're slumming. And for dessert, you just crackle, crackle those lambdas. It's, it's just sugar for the AST, right? If I, if I say A, B t goes to max A minus B times 42 comma zero, I can, I can crack that open and, and turn it upside down into an AST, and I'm back at step two with my AST. There's nothing, nothing magic here, folks. No, no language magic at all. But it is a long string to pull. There's, there's gonna be dessert for breakfast. Uh, and this, this is the slide that, uh, that, that Neil already, uh, already scooped me on. Um, I think that there's a way to do the, the primitive stuff. Uh, I don't say Haskell type classes. I just think them. Um, but yeah, there, you can do uh, behavioral generics that, um, that, are, that, that are paired with appropriate uh, passive data and, uh, and that can give you operator overloading with principles and documentation and constraints and invariance and, and science. So uh, yeah, there's ways to do it, I think. I'm just rashly speculating. And there's always more we want, but I won't go into it because I'm done and over time. And so that's it.